Ladies and gentlemen, laughing hyena recording artist, Ron White. Good evening. How are y'all? Good. Oh. I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm originally from uh, Fritch, Texas. When I was seven years old, my family moved to Borger, Texas, which is kind of like moving from Bedrock to Hooterville. <laughs> The problem with living there for a long time is that there was no culture whatsoever, but we put an end to that. <laughs> I guess the most exhilarating thing I can remember about growing up in Borger as a youth was going down to Ray's Pharmacy and buying rubbers. Rubbers. I went down there one day, I was about 13 years old, and I wanted Ray to think I was maturing a little bit, kind of figuring out the ways of the world, and I just walked up to the counter and said, Ray, I want to buy a propylapic. <laughs> French tickler. He looked at me and said, son, do you have any idea what that'll do to a woman? I said, uh, no, but it'll make a goat jump this high. <laughs> I went back for the high school reunion last year, and I was walking through the old classrooms, and uh, they still had them pieces of shit Bell and Howe movie projectors that they had when I was there. <laughs> When I was there, the thing sounded like <laughs> I'd be better educated today if I could have understood what the fuck they were talking about. <laughs> you know, I was always in trouble because I never paid attention. The teacher would always come back in the classroom and say, okay, Ron. You want to tell this class exactly what river they were traveling down? <laughs> and uh, what else can I tell you about myself as if that wasn't enough? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I'm a, a cowboy. I'm a real cowboy. I was a bronc rider for six years and it's affected me. Now when I have sex, my arm goes like this. <laughs> and there seems to be some dispute between the wife and I whether or not I'm staying on that full eight seconds. <laughs> so we got the timer and buzzer and set it up right there in the bedroom. <laughs> feel like I taught her the meaning of the phrase most of the time. <laughs> Would have been all the time, but she won't let me tie that rope around her waist anymore. <laughs> she hates it when I spur her out of the chutes. <laughs> My wife uh, takes a lot of crap while I'm up on this stage, and uh, she shouldn't because she's the perfect wife. <laughs> Oh, she never bitches. Well, she has that one bitch that all women have. Could you please quit scratching your balls? <laughs> I always say, sure, if you'll scratch them. <laughs> you guys back me up on this. <laughs> we don't much give a damn who scratches them. <laughs> As long as them bastards get scratched. <laughs> I hear a lot of, well, Ron, you pretty good sized old boy. Guess the little woman's a good cook. Bullshit. <laughs> Oh, well, it got a little better when she figured out that smoke alarm's not a timer. <laughs> <laughs> you 
<laughs> you had to tell her, honey, the food is done before that particular buzzer goes off. <laughs> It was real bad when we first got married. The first meal she cooked in our new house, I couldn't eat it. I gave it to the dog. He starts licking his butt. <laughs> she comes in and says, Honey, what's he doing? I said, like, It looks like he's trying to get the taste out of his mouth. <laughs> You don't mind if I smoke? Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. I don't normally smoke. It's just something I do while I'm on the road to keep my hands off my dick. It's a... Oh. I, guess, I guess I can tell you a little bit about my relationship with my wife. Uh, we have been in a, in a monogam, monog, uh, what is it, just one person? Monotonous relationship. <laughs> For nine years, and uh, it's not easy being married to a professional smart ass, I know. <laughs> And I mean, we have fights, but we get along okay. We, we just have a tendency to have fights, but we have fights over little bitty things, and then we end up saying things and doing things that later on we wish we hadn't have said, done. I'll give you an example. <laughs> My wife and I had a real bad fight one night, the one about the thermostat. And she went outside and cut the tires on my pickup truck. <laughs> So I drug up an old Polaroid and entered her in Hustler's Beaver Hunt. <laughs> and she won. <laughs> and I used the money to get me some new tires. <laughs> she super glued my dick to my stomach. <laughs> No, no way my dick could be that big. You know, I hate that. Women have like three or four different ways to tell how big a man's weenie is. That, that bugs the shit out of me. I mean, you hear him in the bars all the time going, well, you know, he's kind of cute, but he has real small hands. And, and we don't have a clue about them. I mean, if it was fair... You guys back me up on this. <laughs> We'd have a clue about them, like the size of their, I don't know, nostrils or something. <laughs> They'd be like, well, she's kind of cute, Bob, but shit, she could snort a plum. <laughs> You know, I swear, there'll be some guy tonight going, no, honey, you swear to God, you couldn't snort a BB, you know. <laughs> you can barely breathe with that thing. <laughs> hmm. But I, you know, after nine years of marriage, I still don't understand my wife. Uh, she gets mad at me when I'm trying to help her. I'll give you an example. <laughs> Let's say she wakes up in the morning and she's real bitchy. And I know in my heart she's suffering from PMS. And out of my love for her, I offer her a my dog. <laughs> I tell her, honey, I believe if you eat this my dog, you won't bitch quite so much. <laughs> she will growl at me, and she won't eat the my dog. If it's my idea for my wife to eat a my dog, I gotta hide it in a piece of cheese. <laughs> Well, 
Last week, uh, I was in uh, Clearwater, Florida at the Sheraton Sand Key Hotel, and uh, which is the same hotel where Jim Baker fucked that chick. <laughs> I was sitting out on the beach thinking to myself, well, hell, if Baker didn't make it through a week of this, <laughs> who the hell am I trying to kid, huh? <laughs> uh, I was doing some shows there. I thought it was kind of weird. One night I was, I was just setting up another joke, and I mentioned that there was 40,000 men stationed at this army base right outside of town, which there was, and this real well-dressed drunk chick hollers out, every one of them's a bad fuck. <laughs> Ma'am? <laughs> I said, now wait a minute, you mean to tell me you've had sex with all these guys and every one of them's a bad fuck? And she said, that's right. I said, uh, boy, you know, it seems like after about 39,000 times you'd start to go, maybe it's me. <laughs> God, maybe I need to read a book or something. <laughs> anyway, while I was there, I met a, I met a girl from uh, Paris, France, that was penthouse good looking. And uh, I talked to her for a little bit. She spoke real broken English, not unlike myself. <laughs> And she was laid out by the swimming pool in one of them little French bikinis that don't hardly cover up. Shit. <laughs> well, I wanted to impress her, so I ran up to the hotel room and slipped into my Speedo bathing suit. <laughs> what are y'all laughing at? <laughs> I look good in a Speedo. Oh, when I sit down, you can't exactly see it. <laughs> when I stand up, hody ho ho. <laughs> Looks like a summer sausage wrapped in cellophane. <laughs> well, I went out to the pool area, and she had gotten in the water by this time, so I just kind of posed around a little bit. <laughs> Some little kid went, look, mommy, a sumo wrestler. <laughs> Which kind of chapped my ass. <laughs> then I done me a big old swan dive into the pool. Came up from what was left of the water. <laughs> And she was gazing at me. She had that, I want a fat man look in her eye. <laughs> then she said the most sexy sounding thing I'd ever heard in my life in French. She looked at me and she said, Ta un croc de la dan ta moustache. And then she turned around and walked away and I was in love. <laughs> Till I found out that meant you have a booger in your mustache. <laughs> you know, I used to, uh... I used to smoke pot, but I, I don't anymore. I don't care if you do. If you do, more power to you. If you don't, that's fine with me. It's got nothing to do with you. It's my decision. And, uh... <laughs> and I'll tell you why I quit. Yesterday... <laughs> No, this was a few months back. I, I was in Des Moines, Iowa, and I got busted smoking a joint in my hotel room. Don't that beat the fuck out of all. <laughs> and I'll I, I tell you how it happened. I was, I, I, I came back to the hotel that night and I had smoked a half a joint, left the other half in the ashtray. 
The next morning I had to do two radio shows and a TV show. So uh, while I was gone, the maid came in and she saw the half a joint and courteously called the police in my behalf. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me. <laughs> So I come back from doing the TV show and uh, roll up a joint the size of Nebraska. <laughs> and I just smoke about half of it down and comes a knock on the door and I walk over to the door and open it up and there's three narcotics officers standing in a cloud. <laughs> said, Mr. White, <coughs> we have reason to believe you have marijuana in your hotel room. Well, I figured we was fixing to take a look. <laughs> uh, so I said, yeah, and I, they came in and I told them I was a comedian from out of town, signed an autograph picture for one of them, and one guy was on the phone talking to the police station to see if I had an arrest record. But he couldn't get it. You know, somebody was on hold of the computers were down or something. So he was just standing there telling me, he said, uh, you had never been arrested. Now, what went through my mind was, not in this state, huh? <laughs> sure as hell hadn't. So no, I thought was the appropriate answer for that question. And uh, so they were leaving. They were going to let me go. And by the time they, right about the time they get to the door, this guy's beeper goes off. When I was 17 years old, I was arrested for stealing a CB radio out of a car. When I got arrested, I was drunk, and the arresting officer at jail asked me, Mr. White, do you have any aliases? So being a smart-ass kid, I said, yeah, they call me Tater Salad. <laughs> Fifteen years later, in Des Moines, Iowa, this cop, talking on the phone, answering that beep, looks at me and says, Are you Ron Tater Salad White? <laughs> well, fuck me. <laughs> you know what, the last time I was in uh, Atlanta, uh, so put, people took me to and uh, down the Chattahoochee River. Now I know you generally do that in rafts, but we didn't have no rafts, so we did it in inner tubes. And I, I was amazed by this, or baffled, I guess it'd be the word, because uh, 21 of us met down there to tube this river. We had six ice chests full of beer. We floated down that river drinking beer for six and a half hours. Not one person had to pee. <laughs> I find that to be remarkable bladder control there. I'd, I'd like to think my friends wouldn't be peeing on themselves. I, I know I would. <laughs> that was the best thing about tubing the river. You could just paddle up to somebody you don't even know. <laughs> Talk to them while you're peeing on yourself. You're peeing on yourself. I guess we've been floating down that river for about an hour before I realized to myself, well, everybody's just pissing on themselves. <laughs> I thought, well, hell, I'll just piss on myself. Everybody got mad at me. Of course, I was in a canoe. <laughs> I've uh, been married for nine years, uh, and I'm having my first child July 16th, thereabouts of this year. We're about to have our first baby. And uh, it was a little surprise. <laughs> you know, and it's just got me in a total state of shock. And I know I should be excited about it. Because, you know, like a young couple, if they just starting out wanting to have a kid, going to the fertility clinic, reading all the little books and stuff, they're all fired up. And as soon as this guy finds out his wife is pregnant, he wants to look up her butthole with an ear light. <laughs> and I have never wanted to look up my wife's butthole with an ear light. <laughs> All right, once. Uh, <laughs> we were fishing, she was drunk, and <laughs> I had the ear light right there in my pocket. <laughs> 
figured, well, what the fuck? <laughs> Mm. Mm. But anyway, we don't have any kids yet. We do have an English bulldog named Sluggo. Sluggo. And I uh, love him more than you ought to love a dog. I think uh, dogs in general are kind of a pain in the butt because if a dog gets sick, you can't just feed it medicine. you got to hide it in a piece of cheese. <laughs> well, we stud Sluggo out for... Uh, pig of the litter last year and we put him with the female dog for about two weeks and then to make sure it took we took him down to the veterinarian's office and had artificial insemination done twice now for those of you that don't know that's where they obtained the semen from sluggo and put it in the female dog and now it don't take shit to get my dog to go to the vet <laughs> You say something around my house, it sounds like vet and my dog's humping air. <laughs> yeah, honey, did we get that letter in the mail from the Veterans Administration? <laughs> oh, God damn. <laughs> you know, I went down there, the veterinarian had the audacity to say to me, Mr. White, if you'll just come on back here, we'll show you how to do this. Next time you don't have to bring in the dog, you can just bring in the semen. I said, that's okay, dog. <laughs> you go ahead and jack off the dog. <laughs> yeah, he follows me around too much as it is. <laughs> But enough of this uh, comedy stuff. Uh, here's a kind of a sad story about Sluggo. He got started getting older. He bit a couple of kids. He started getting real mean. And we thought we were going to have to have him put to sleep last year. And uh, I called my vet. That vet's just two blocks from our house. And I called him up and I said, man, the older this dog gets, the meaner he gets. And he, he said, well, he may have a hormone imbalance. And if you'll bring him in, we'll castrate him. And this will balance his hormones and maybe he'll be all right. Well, I figure nothing from nothing leaves nothing. And <laughs> so I put on three pair of Levi's and two flannel shirts and got some welding gloves and a tire iron and a chain and went out there and beat the dog over the head with a tire iron, wrapped that chain around his neck. I was just going to walk him to the vet two blocks down the road. And we get out on the sidewalk and Sluggo sees this old man and he goes crazy. Breaks the chain, he runs down there, he jumps on this old man, starts tearing him up. Well, I'm freaking out. I run down there and pull Sluggo off this old man and start apologizing to him. I said, look, buddy, I'm sorry, the dog has a hormone imbalance. I'm taking him down right now to have his balls cut off. Old man looked at me and said, have his balls cut off? You ought to have his teeth pulled. <laughs> well, I could tell when he was 50 yards away, he didn't want to fuck me. <laughs> you, you guys hear more about this uh, devil worship stuff than you used to in this area? Is that a surfacing thing? Because it is in Texas. Now, well, that's a real serious subject and something you shouldn't make fun of, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and it's not even a joke I wrote, so hang with me on this. I just saw this on television. This senator from Texas comes on the news, and he says this. He says, I'm trying to get a bill passed through the Texas legislature that will make it illegal in the state of Texas to drink human blood. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but if you have in your possession a cup of human blood, and it ain't yours. <laughs> Hadn't you already broke some major rules? <laughs> and it was a misdemeanor. It wasn't even a felony. The guy thought it would help deter human sacrifice. And, you, know, you can see a guy out there going, well, I'll help you kill him, but I'm not drinking that blood. <laughs> you don't know, if you get caught, you get a life sentence for murder, and they slap a $50 fine right on top of that. Fuck you. Uh -uh, I ain't gonna... <laughs> No, you couldn't pay it, you'd ruin your credit. <laughs> oh, spent a lot of time uh, growing up as a child. <laughs> Living with my grandmother in uh, Fritch, and 
Now, Fritch is a whole dunk little shit town you've never heard of. Less than 700 people in my hometown, no shit. And uh, there's nothing to do there. It's the most boring place in the universe. It was like a sentence to go live with my grandmother. And the summer that I lived there, that I was uh, 12 years old, I figured out something to do. And my grandma caught me in the bathroom <laughs> just to doing it. <laughs> Now, what makes this bad is that my grandmother was a real religious woman, and whatever I did wrong as a child, she had a Bible verse she could slap me in the face with that applied to exactly what I had done. I thought, not this time, Grandma. <laughs> and I was wrong. <laughs> About 30 minutes later, she walks into the bedroom. She says, uh, well, it says right here in the good book, grandson, that it is better for your seed to fall in the belly of a whore than on the ground. <laughs> said, boy, it's tough to argue with that kind of logic, Grandma. <laughs> you got 50 bucks. <laughs> First time I ever had sex in my life, my grandmother caught me in her garage and she Bible thumped me. <laughs> and I was kind of a smart ass little kid, if you can imagine. <laughs> And she told me that someday I'd be standing side by side with the Lord, watching my life pass before my eyes, answering for each and every one of my sins. And what would I say to him when this came up? I told her, I'm going to tell him, watch this, here comes the good part. <laughs> kind of like to see this again myself. <laughs> oh, I was 15, but I was throwing some dick here. This is... Hmm. Yeah, I started working uh, ski resorts in Colorado this year, and uh, I got to go snow skiing for the first time in my life. Bye, applause. Snow skiers in here? Yeah, I hated it. I thought it sucked. <laughs> they called me Dr. Plow. <laughs> the other thing I don't like about it is if you don't know how to do it, even if you spend $800 on shit to wear, you still look like a fucking dweeb. <laughs> you know, you got to ski down the weenie slopes. And the, the great skiers get to ski down slopes with great names like Devil's Backbone and Razor's Edge. I'm over here trying to look macho, wedging my way down Pussy Pass. <laughs> And they got them little seven-year-old ski fucks flying by, <laughs> throwing snow in my face, and I can't catch them, <laughs> which is why they give you them poles. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's not true. That's not true. I can't get my revenge on the children that way because skiing is not a fat man's sport. If I'm going to get my revenge on the little children, and mind you, I will, I'm going to do it participating in a fat man's sport, a sport in which every single time a fat man participates, a fat man will prevail. Only one such sport in the entire universe. Anybody know what it is? Nope, nope, nope. Water slides. <laughs> I'm the fastest man on the track down at the water slide. <laughs> I'll be standing in line behind two of them seven-year-old ski fucks. <laughs> Just just standing stand in there in my Speedo. <laughs> And they're not even worried because they're seven years old. They don't know shit about gravity. <laughs> the, the guy running the slide lets them take two turns down the slide before he puts me on it. I'm thinking to myself, big fucking deal. <laughs> That'll give me time to sharpen my to toenails. <laughs> It doesn't matter when they put me in the chute, all the water backs up behind me. <laughs> They're skidding on their little butts down there at the bottom. 
kids behind me are drowning. <laughs> the speedo monster. <laughs> Oh, I love water slides. You know what I hate? Six flags over anywhere. <laughs> but it, what does it cost? 37,000 bucks to get in? And then six flags. I went last year and some people took me. This out, what's that ride where they just drop you off? Is that the free fall? I stood in line for 55 fucking minutes <laughs> to ride the free fall for 0. .002 seconds. <laughs> Most miserable point oh oh two seconds of my life. <laughs> if you've never ridden it, what they do is they just jack you right off the air ground, 30 floors, push you out over a ledge, and pull the pins, hoss 12 G's hit your body. <laughs> your nose is playing out like little hair. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> I got off the ride, the attendant said, you want to ride her again? I said, yeah, but this time I'm going to stick a marble up my butt and see how far it flies out of my nose. <laughs> oh. I finally decided the other day that uh, TV commercials have gotten just a little bit too abstract for a man of my education. Uh, I was watching a commercial the other day for a product called Calvin Klein's Obsessions for Men. And I'm not going to buy the crap. Uh, it was a terrible commercial. They showed all these little people just dancing all around. And they show this real skinny guy with no shirt on, kind of a faggy looking fella. <laughs> and for some reason during the commercial, this old boy has bust into flames. He did. He busted into flames. He had little flames all over his body. And then he stopped and made a speech about how he's willing to burn in hell to smell like a queer or something. <laughs> Which didn't even bother me. What bothered me about the commercial was at the end of the commercial, this real sensuous brunette comes out and she says, I'd know him in the dark. I was like, fuck, I'd know him in the dark. The guy's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> What's the trick? <laughs> Is it me or does it seem like there's a whole lot more homosexuals than there used to be? They don't reproduce, do they? <laughs> Isn't it? Because in 1975 there was eight, what, ten queers in the whole U.S. <laughs> and now every time you turn on the damn TV, they're there on the news marching up down the street, got a little sign saying, yeah, I'm queer. <laughs> it's like you need a sign. <laughs> And, and if there's any gay people here tonight, I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm teasing. I, I truly believe in my heart that you have the right to do whatever you want to do. I just have the right to say whatever I want to say. And... <laughs> and you have the right to kick my ass <laughs> if you can get 10 or 12 of you together. <laughs> But then how would you get them apart, you know? <laughs> oh. And any, any prejudices that I might have towards that community stem from ignorance, and I think all prejudices do. And I, I, it's because I grew up in a little bitty town in West Texas where they didn't talk about them at all, and I grew up ignorant of their plight. And that's my problem, not there. I didn't know a thing about them. Nothing, nothing. I was like 17 or 18 years old, and... I knew it was like men get together with other men. I knew that much. But sexually, I thought they like got together once a week and bumped dickheads. Or... <laughs> kind of a jousting deal. And then I found out what it is that they do, and I was like, no, really? Why? Oh, what would you have to look forward to the rest of your life? I mean, what if you had like a really bad day and that's what you had to... Well, let's say you're a queer. Let's say you've had a real bad day at the office. You hate typing. You have a flat tire on the way home from work in the rain. 
you get home, you break your key off in the door lock, you have to break a window to get in, you cut your finger. Then you say to yourself, all is not lost. <laughs> Maybe somebody will stop by a little later and fuck me in the butt. <laughs> And that'll make their day. <laughs> and would it make a day for them? It'd ruin a whole year for me. <laughs> I mean, if somebody came up to me, uh, how was your year last year, Ron? I'd be like, well, I made pretty good money, but I got fucked in the butt back in February. And... <laughs> Hell, I really hadn't got over that. Huh? <laughs> hmm. Well, they got everything. Now they got their own beer, queer beer. Oh, they call it old Milwaukee. <laughs> Have you seen that commercial? Five guys out in the middle of the woods, not a woman in sight. When I'm going, well, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Oh, squeal for me, Billy Bob. <laughs> Make him little animal noises like you done the other day for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I heard on, on TV about six months ago where they've now determined that mosquitoes carry the AIDS virus, which brings up an interesting question. Who's been fucking mosquitoes? <laughs> Now that's sick. <laughs> now there's some needle dick guy out there. <laughs> and you gotta be real gentle or you'll pull a wing right off a mosquito. <laughs> Oh, and I, this is uh, like my third time back to Atlanta, and uh, I appreciate you guys coming out. I've uh, really had a good time here. We, they, I, I like Atlanta because the bars close sometime tomorrow. <laughs> we went out last night, and uh, I got back to my hotel room at uh, 7.30 this morning, and I went up to the desk to leave a wake-up call, and I told the girl behind the desk, I said, I need to leave a wake-up call for 7 o'clock, and she said, Mr. White, it's past 7. <laughs> I said, no, the next one. <laughs> you got another one coming around, don't you, sweetheart? <laughs> Why don't you just put me on that one? <laughs> well, I hear they're running two a day through Marietta now. <laughs> oh. But they've taken us all over the place. They took us to CNN to, you know, see how all that's done. They took us over to the Cheetah Three. <laughs> you, you, you guys go to titty bars at all? That's a, well, yeah, a few don't yeah. I, I wasn't even, uh, I wasn't even going to go because, well, you guys back me up on this. You, you've seen one tit. You want to see the rest of them bastards. So. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we went out there. We rated the women in three major categories. We rated them in overall tits number of butt warbles <laughs> and probability of being a disease carrier I, I got to go uh, two weeks ago for the first time in my life to do a week of stand up in New York City and boy I blended in there <laughs> I mean I'm different and I'm willing to admit it you know like y'all say tomato they say tomato and I say mater <laughs> Some people were looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate. <laughs> yeah, but I ended up having a good time, you know, which is tough for a Texan to even say. I don't know if it's because I'm from the South or I talk the way I do, but I, I found out after I'd been in New York for a little while that these people believe every word that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> so I told them I was Armadillo Dundee. <laughs> Good for a couple of beers. 
Uh, they made a big deal about the sushi there. They kept telling me, try the sushi, because they don't have that in Texas. And uh, So I went out to a takeout place, and I got some, and I took it back to the condo. And I don't see what the big deal is. If you fry it up, it tastes just like fish. <laughs> I was in uh, Cincinnati uh, the week before I was in New York. and uh, by, by chance, is there anybody here from Cincinnati this evening? Really? Because I hate them people. <laughs> no, really. Now, I, I, back me up on this. I, I had a big problem with those people the first night I was in their town about their chili. I did a show. I come off stage. I'm looking for something to eat. Across the street from the club is a place called Skyline Chili. Next door to that is a place called Gold Star Chili, Cross Eve, Liberty Chili, Jim Chili, Bob Chili, Joe Chili, Chili everywhere. Now, I'm not trying to start any shit with the chili boy. I'm just making late night conversation. I said, uh, boy, you know it seems like there's a whole lot of chili places here. You wouldn't think there would be, would you? He got real shitty with me. He said this, he said, I'll oh, have you know, the Cincinnati area is the chili capital of the world. <laughs> I said, oh, excuse me for thinking it might be Mexico City or <laughs> Guadalajara goddamn horror. <laughs> I don't even think they told the Mexican boys they were having a contest. Because <laughs> a Mexican boy would go up there with a goat and an onion and kick their ass. <laughs> Hmm. Ugh. Started playing uh, Las Vegas this year. And uh, I'll give you some idea how my luck went while I was in Vegas. The, the last night I was there, I put 50 cents in a Coke machine. Nothing came out. I didn't even get pissed. I just moved to the next machine. <laughs> Put 50 cents in the next machine, a drink came out. I thought I'd fucking won something. <laughs> Played that machine the rest of the night. <laughs> One, four and a half cases of diet, set them up. <laughs> Only cost me $1,800. <laughs> They, they keep shoveling you the liquor, too. As long as you're gambling, you're drinking free if you want to be in Las Vegas. And uh, I was pulling on that slot machine, throwing back at Jack Daniels. I passed out with my head in the toilet, woke up tugging on the handle going, Come on, baby! The last time I was in uh, Vegas, for the first time in my career, I was held over for two nights by popular demand. <laughs> popular demand of the Nevada State Police Department. <laughs> Little D-U-I-S-K-Y. And uh, I, th I thought the cop was just jacking with me because I'm an entertainer, and I, I accused him of that. I said, I think you're just messing with me because I'm a comedian. He said, uh, no, sir, Mr. White, we stopped every vehicle traveling down that particular sidewalk. <laughs> Well, fuck me, you know. I, you know, but he made me do a field sobriety test. You know, like he couldn't tell I was drunk by looking at me. I had vomit on my shirt. Ooh, he did, though. He made me do one of these Olga Corbett, Nadia Comaneci balance routine things. Where you stand on one foot and raise the other foot six inches off the ground and count to 30, I made it to woo. <laughs> you know, he asked me before I did it, he said, uh, he said, Mr. White, do you have any physical disabilities that would keep you from being able to do this? Well, I figured, start lying now. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I had both my knees crushed riding bulls. And he said, well, you can still work, can't you? 
I said, well, I'm a stand-up comic. I only work 45 minutes a day. <laughs> he said, you stand up, don't you? I said, not on one foot. <laughs> then I went to jail. <laughs> Uh, you know, they don't impound your car if you get thrown in jail in uh, Nevada either. And my, while I was in jail, somebody broke into my pickup truck and stole my radio, which pissed me off. And I had to go to the insurance company, and I was filling out these forms, and I got to the part on the form where it says, what kind of radio was it? And I told old boy, I don't remember what kind of radio it was. And he said, uh, Mr. White, if you can remember what kind of radio it was, we'll know how much money to give you. <laughs> Well, that's some good goddamn news right there. <laughs> I thought of a real expensive sounding brand and I wrote that down. He knew I was lying. He said, uh, Mr. White, I don't believe Rolex makes a radio. <laughs> I'm going to do one more story, and then I'm going to get out of here. Now, this is a true story. What might lead you to believe the rest of this has been a crock of shit. Uh, I was in the Navy for two years, stationed at Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu. And I don't know why it is, but for some reason, there's tons and tons of transvestites on this island. Tons and tons. And that's a weird breed of monkey in anybody's book, you your regular queer, won't even talk to them. Now, I was there, I was 17 years old, had pimples. I was fat, if you can imagine. And I was sitting at this bar with a couple of my buddies, and this real good-looking woman walks up to our table, and she says, Guys, blowjob's in the parking lot for five bucks. Now, you guys back me up on this. <laughs> A $5 blowjob is an entertainment value. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just is. Because <laughs> yeah, you can't get a good blowjob anymore. <laughs> Men fuck that up with that whole swallow thing. <laughs> oh, does she swallow? Oh, who gives a shit? <laughs> If you're ever giving me a blowjob and I have an orgasm, spin it in a fucking carpet. I don't care. <laughs> spin it in a potted plant. That's what I'd do with it. <laughs> I'd be going, tuh, tuh, tuh. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> well, I'll never suck your dick again. <laughs> But anyway, we started thinking that maybe it's one of those uh, transvestites. And there's a couple of ways you can tell if you don't know. Because if they've got like real big veins in the back of their hands, or if they're wearing like a size 13 pump, <laughs> or if you're dancing with one of them and they pop a big old boner on your leg. <laughs> This should be the more concise of the three methods. <laughs> and the first two are a little iffy. <laughs> they pop that boner on your leg. You got you a pooper poker now. <laughs> right, this old boy wants to play a game of butt darts is what's going on here. <laughs> so anyway, we... Uh, figured out it's a transvestite and we said uh, go and get out of here like you would and she said wouldn't you rather go home with me than go home alone and I said I'd rather sandpaper the asshole of an alligator in a phone booth <laughs> well she conjured up a mental picture of that <laughs> took it to mean huh uh so she walks over 
over to Harvey Spivey's table. Now, Harvey Spivey had been in the Navy for 13 years. He's from Macon, Georgia. He's a bald-headed, beer-gut, redneck, alcoholic asshole. But knows an entertainment value. When he hears one and... Uh, they get up and leave together, and they come back in about 10 minutes. Oh, Harvey's just a grinning. He walks straight over to our table. He says, guys, blowjobs in the parking lot for five bucks. And we started laughing at him. We said, Harvey, that was a man. <laughs> said, I know, but five bucks. <laughs> Thank you, Atlanta. That's Ron White, ladies and gentlemen, Ron White. Let him hear it.